Brain Cafe, is it now? We're so happy to have Dr. Wishick from the uh, New England Center for ADHD. And uh, we hope you'll get involved tonight. That's the point, <laughs> that we have this dialogue from all parts of the world and fields and energy. And uh, we always call it an experiment because uh, as artists, we never know how things will work out, where we're going exactly. And of course, these are fresh off the presses. What we show tonight is something we've just been working on recently and hope you'll enjoy. Uh, anything else I have to tell you? There's something I think. Oh yes, I think people are anxious. If anyone wants to join our mailing list, we're making it very easy tonight. We're sticking mailing things in your programs. And uh, Yes. Was there anything else? There was something else. Oh, that there's another brain cafe. <laughs> I got a prompt too bad there. There's another brain cafe. It's going to happen on uh, the last Thursday of June. And this is going to be, uh, the subject will be Tourette's. And that should be exciting because we had the young lady, who, an artist, who wanted us to do so badly our cafe on Tourette's. And uh, she wanted to use some of her movements as a dance. And our hip hop dancers are very excited about taking this on. Yay, Sophia <laughs> and Edgar. So that's the next project. So here we go. Let's start the evening. And if, if you don't have a program, I hope you can borrow one. We sort of ran out. <laughs> Without a beat, I was so stressed out. I was so antsy and I couldn't pay attention to anything. I needed noise, it was so bad. I, I can't take this test, it's too quiet. That's the weirdest thing to tell a teacher. <laughs> First grade, coming in from recess. Everyone comes in and I'm the last one. I come in with this huge branch, twice the size of me, and I'm hanging out everywhere. <laughs> I'm talking about, I'm hitting chairs, sneakers, tables. I'm just creating a beat and I need to find the sound that I need to hear. I'm banging like crazy now to the point where everyone's getting annoyed me. Finally, the teacher comes, gets up, and yells at me. Edgar, <laughs> this is not appropriate in the classroom. Please have a seat. <laughs> but I was smart enough to grab a small stick as well. All of a sudden, you hear a small tapping under the desk, and everyone's looking up trying to find out who it is. I stop. I look around trying to find out who it is, too. <laughs> no one can find the culprit, so I keep tapping. The teacher looks around a couple of times trying to find the secret tapping. <laughs> the teacher goes back to the board to do the problem. In the middle of do the problem, he turns around and catches him. I thought it was you, Edgar. Let's go. Principal's office. Ooh. Third grade. My third grade teacher was very strict and also the vice principal. She loved silence during classes, especially during tests and homework. So she hated sound. And trust me, I was the worst child to have in your class. I would be tapping away with my pens and pencils, creating a beat that I didn't even know what I was doing. I would tap and tap and tap. And she had a three strike policy. First strike, she'll yell at me. Edgar! Half an hour later, tapping on this goes again. Second strike, she warns me. Last warning. I'm tapping and tapping and tapping. Third strike, That's takes it. away everything. You've lost your pencil privileges. <laughs> How can I finish my test without a pencil? 
So since I didn't have a pen or pencil, I needed to focus on my work. So to focus, I started gently tapping my hand on the table. The teacher noticed right away I was tapping again. But I was doing my work. The teacher thinks that I'm doing wrong. So then she thinks I am purposely trying to defy her and disobey. So Let's this is when... Principal's office. Again. <laughs> and then, my boy, me math blasted. This game seriously changed my life because it allowed me to use, have my beats and math at the same time. It was so much fun that I used to play it all the time. But when I was in school, I didn't have a keyboard, so I kind of had to imagine. Two plus four equals six. Ten minus three equals seven. Um, four plus five equals nine. Enough of the drumming. Let's get back to work. This is when I had to start to learn how to hide my, my keyboard. So I decided, let me put my keyboard on my legs. One, two, three, four, five would be on this leg. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten would be on this leg. Now let me show you how to do a problem. One, two, three. Wait, I forgot to tell you. I need to come up with a method to show my addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division signs. This is how it went. One hit would be for addition. Two hits would be for subtraction. Three hits would be for division. Three. And a double hit slap would be for multiplication. Now let me show you a simple equation. One, two, three, four, five, plus one, two, three, equals one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, nine. Now this is what, this was going fine until we got into double digits. <laughs> so now I had to come up with a new technique. So I decided, why don't I put all my single digits onto one leg and my double digits on another leg? This would work. So now if I was gonna show a number like 22, I'll hit twice on my tens leg, I'll have 20. I'll hit twice on my singles leg, I'll have 22. Now things are going well. And I was doing fine until triple digits now. <laughs> oh man, this was the worst, seriously. So with my old method, if I was trying to show 200, I would have to hit my right leg 20 times. <laughs> Now that just took way too long. So since I already knew how to drum, I used a rolling method. And this method let me go through the numbers faster. So now I'd only have to do this four times to get to the same number of 200. One, two, three, four. Since I knew this method now, if my teacher gave me a triple digit equation, I could do it. 120 divided by 13. Let me show you how this would go. 50, 100. 110, 120, divided by 10 plus 1, 2, 3, 13. Now, I just plugged the numbers into the monitor in my head. I needed to keep a steady beat to keep my mind focused and clear. This is how it looked. Nine with a remainder of three. All right, class. 169 divided by 13. Now this method was great and all, and it kept my math scores up. But remember, I had to hide this from everybody.
Without noise in my life or in my little head I feel alone, I feel this oncoming sense of dread Cause I, I cannot think about just one single little thing Because I have a Noise. I love sounds that tick tock, sounds that bitty bap, boop bop, shmama wop, bibby bap, bibby bap. Just don't give me anything else but Recently, actually, Dorothy and um, Bob uh, took a test with me, and I passed hard. Like, <laughs> really, Bob? Tell me, we passed. Really? Ooh, I, I have a problem. Like, like, <laughs> so, at age 21, right? Yep, 21. This is me. Do you play the drums? Huh? Do you play the drums? On my free time, yeah. Uh, I always was a tapper, so I just like rhythm. I dance now, so rhythm's kind of my thing. Did you really use that system for doing your math at school? No, I did when I was younger. I said, like, when I got older, obviously, math got more complicated, and I got in trouble for not, especially in ninth grade, I got in a lot of trouble for not showing work. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of got in a feud with that teacher, and I was forced to show work, and after that, I kind of just had to follow that system and go with school. So it worked for a while I was little. Tell them, though, they, uh, they put him in a room. Oh, yeah. Uh, the teacher. Ready? Um, I forgot his name. It started with a W, but I was at St. Ray's, and my teacher thought I was cheating because all I had was just answers on my test. So he made me retake a new test, and I was by myself, and he had the principal sit in the room with me while I'm taking it. And I'm taking it. Remind me, this is my free period. Like, come on, man. So I'm going, and I take the test, and then I pass it, and so the principal finally gets the teacher off my back and says, he's my teacher. He's able to control whatever he wants when I'm in class. So he made sure to torture me and take off points whenever I didn't show work. I got a lot of 50% partial points all the time. It was a challenge, it was. Do you feel any different now that you've been diagnosed? I feel weird, now I feel like, before I thought I was normal, now <laughs> I have to think I'm not, I guess. I don't, I don't know that. When I, when I first found out, I was like trying to figure out ways to like switch my answers to make me seem normal, I guess. Like I was like, no, I'm totally normal, I don't do this. But then you start real, trust me, those questions make you feel like, you do everything on the list, I swear. It was like random things like, do you, are you very impatient? Do you, <laughs> I'm not impatient, I'm very. But the thing is like, that test like really makes you realize things that you do, like, it's not all your fault. One before, like I was blaming myself for like, man, I was just a hyper kid that like, what the hell? But tell them about the choreography. I mean, oh, like, that works how, how it works for your uh, music and choreography. Oh, well, obviously when it came to music, I could catch rhythm with like ease, like I have, I could sit down in class and like literally watch someone do choreography and catch on to it like that without even getting up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but like when I hear some music, everyone he hears the simple tempo. But for some reason, I'm, I hear all the extra sounds that people like m miss out on. And it just helped me so much more with music. I don't know why. But I pay attention to the different stuff that everyone else doesn't pay attention to. So I guess I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I wonder, do you find math 
um, that it comes easily to you besides your, um, you know, the method that you came up with? So when you had to write it down and just focus on it, was it, was it harder? I mean, it was hard, right? right. But I, was, I was always told that I was good in math. Yeah. So I just listened to whatever people say. I didn't really care about it myself because it was school. When you're little, you're not paying attention. I'm like, I want to have fun, fun, yay. It yeah, seems I mean, like you have some kind of extra like feeling for it. Like, is that the rhythm little, thing that you were doing? Is like a, I have fun doing it. I can't lie. It was more fun having a rhythm while you're doing math rather than just doing math. Like if, it's like anything. If you make it into a game, like there's people that sing while they do certain things to memorize scripts and memorize like homework and stuff like it's all about how it makes you feel com like make it more fun for yourself to do it and math was one of those things that I can do it with really easy so if I had a rhythm I can learn that quick yeah so yeah and I uh and maybe Dr. Wishik will speak to this uh in, when he, he speaks uh but there is a creative side to ADHD where there's a lot of contributions made by people who have it so uh it's not strange that he as he told me he's got to dance and he's got to have music at all times. So it all leads to all this wonderful flow of creativity. Uh, reading, what's that like? <laughs> no, wait, I can read, but you know how you, I can, <laughs> I can read perfectly fine, except I have a little problem. Um, when I read, well before when I read, I used to read paragraphs and kind of like, get distracted by other words in other paragraphs, so I'd have to reread what I read because I didn't really retain it. And that sucks, like really bad when you do that. Like it, it, it makes the whole process way longer. So like, I wasn't really a big fan of reading because I wasn't that good at it. I remember um, I got sent to Sylvan Learning Center to get a little help with that. Hey Sylvan, um, but yeah, they helped me kind of learn little tricks to work with that. So uh, I still don't like reading like that. Can't lie, yes. But you're a storyteller. Oh, I can tell stories for days. Oh, just, <laughs> if I can orally do it, like I can tell you, I can talk all day, but read it and write it down, I'm gonna get off topic real quick. You know what I'm <laughs> so, so being diagnosed and told you're different, does that mean uh, at this point that you want to do anything different? Do oh yeah, um, I actually have to get, I have to read a book which is great because I love reading. Like I said, <laughs> I love that stuff. It's great. But yeah, the test was to show me which parts of the book I need to read. So which, um, like certainly, I, I passed a lot of it. So that means I have to read a lot of the book. And basically it's supposed to help me like work around the problems I have. So hopefully I'll be able to like reading sooner or later and actually like, like writing and stuff. That would be dope. How about other parts of your life? Oh, I would love to be able to do stick to one task. That would be great. I love to be able to get ready in the morning on time. That would, that would be another one, rather than going to do a whole bunch of stuff to get out the door. It's pretty bad. We decided that a lot of our uh, crew here, and uh, we just saw this wonderful movie called uh, ADD and Loving It, uh, and uh, which talked about like Hollywood is is ADD city. They say, and so of course. <laughs> We decided our Friday Night Live crew that maybe we're all, <laughs> we're guessing that we might all uh, be, uh, have this wonderful uh, orderly uh, disorder. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should move on right now and you got one more question. Okay, so. What up, Jim? So now that you recognize that you have these challenges with reading, have you found ways to deal with it? Because um, I think it's very important that you, that you recognize this. Well, since I recognize this reading stuff, I'm actually trying to go back to school so I can actually work on this reading stuff. I'm actually trying to take a writing class back in college, woo woo. Which and, you can oh, yeah, that, so I can work on that. But I'm just trying to figure out if this book will have a few tricks for me to learn how to focus more on what I'm reading as well as what I'm writing. Because I'm the type of person, even when I'm writing a paragraph, I jump from subject to subject because I have so many things that's going on in my mind about this one topic. And you know when you're supposed to separate paragraphs? Like you have this introduction and then you have first topic, third, second topic, third. Well, I put that all in the first paragraph. <laughs> and no, it, it is kind of funny, I can't lie. But like, it's really a problem because teachers don't like that. Then you sound crazy. And like everyone usually does like one or two drafts. I do like seven, like it's, it's really bad. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I hope I like but if I get back to just rolls up. Oh, the good stuff though, choreography like rolls up your body. Yeah, I can do that with ease. I I don't know about the counting part, but mm. I can <laughs> cough cough, you know. You know? <laughs> if you could have say you could lose that choreography or that music part and not have the ADD, would you do that choice or would you keep yourself? Dancing? No, absolutely not. No. I'm keeping my dancing. I I'm never gonna quit that. I love dancing. Moving is the best thing that ever happened to me. Absolutely, I'm sorry. Like seriously, I just got to be the last one. Yeah. Then we'll move on. Uh, the fact that you recognize dancing as being something so important to your life. Uh, bottom line is when you read things, make sure you're reading about dancing. See, <laughs> 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 better because all the stuff you just said mm -hmm. is just that you just got diagnosed with something and you've been dealing with it your whole life. It ain't no big deal other than what you're making. So dance, uh, read the way you like to read, and just take off from there. Uh, then you'll be fine. That's okay. right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Family wanted me to be, but 
I was too hyper, I guess. Especially my grandfather. I wanted to impress him the most out of anyone. He was the person that I looked up to the most. That I felt safe around. Yeah. But as I got older, the things that I experienced in Jamaica just messed me up. And I, I didn't have anyone to talk to. When I get angry, my body would just automatically shoot out shockwaves and anger. I'd punch things and I'd throw things. Sometimes I'd flip out so much I'd trash the whole entire apartment. My mom would come home and just, <laughs> she'd lose it. So my mom would go to him all the time and would tell him all the bad things I was doing. Then he had to come over and discipline me. So, to me, he turned into this, you know, this, this figure, this evil, like, <laughs> disciplinary figure that can't, comes in, you know, when it's time to beat you, or discipline you, or whatever. And I guess, with time, as time passed, and I kept doing the same thing, assuming he cared for me less and less. That's what I thought of anyways. I started to feel a little less wanted at home. I don't know if it was my own insecurities or whatever, but I just felt like I wasn't wanted there. The more I felt that way, the more I acted up. The more I acted up, the more I guess I wasn't. So my mom got fed up with me and she decided to uh, put me in DCYF custody. Being in DCYF was hard. Had its ups and its downs. There's a few moments where I felt like I was a child for the first time in my life. Those are the times that I felt violated. After going through DCYF and going to camp and hunting, it's this sort of Native American themed boot camp. The place taught me a lot. Taught me how to work as a group. I think that's one of the most important things for me. It showed me that your actions, bad or good, can affect the whole group. Once I was free, I knew that's where I wanted to stay. I knew I never really wanted to be in an institute where my freedom my ability to choose is just taken away. I don't blame my mom or my grandfather for anything that happened to me as a child. She was a young mom. I was her first kid. She had to do it all by herself. She worked hard every day, getting home tired. She was the best that she could be. boring part of the evening. I can't compete with what we just saw. Um, there was a British pediatrician, George Still, gave a series of lectures describing a group of overactive, defiant, hostile children. If you read his description, most of those children we would now say have ADHD. The lectures were put together in articles published in The Lancet, which is one of a uh, very prestigious British medical journal. Those articles were published in 1902. ADHD is not a new condition. It has been around a very long time. There's much more attention paid to it nowadays, more publicity. People are not ashamed to admit they have ADHD. Um, 
I often think that celebrities going to rehab is nothing new. Years and years ago, people would be bribed to keep it quiet. Now the celebrities are proud of it. They go to rehab, they talk about it. Um, ADHD was hidden in many cases when we were younger. I remember in school there were a lot of vocational paths you could take. The children who didn't do good at school, they went into those. Nowadays, even vocational programs, you need to know how to use a computer. The schools can't hide those children. ADHD is <coughs> caused by underactive circuits in predominantly the frontal lobe of the brain. That's the part of the brain involved in judgment, insight, planning, initiative, self-awareness, self-control. Parts of the brain, incidentally, that don't finish developing until our mid-20s. A um, couple of neurotransmitters are generally considered to be most involved, dopamine and norepinephrine. These are underactive in those frontal lobe circuits of the brain. So the symptoms of ADHD represent other parts of the brain not being under proper control. I'm not a psychiatrist. I know there's a psychiatrist here, so I have to be careful what I say about them. Uh, the psychiatrists have a Bible. They call it the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And it seems that every edition, they change the name of the condition. The next edition is due out in a year or two, and I'm hearing that they may make some significant changes in the ADHD center uh, section of the book. ADHD is characterized by excessive motor overactivity. What does that mean? Fidgety, restless, pace like I do a lot, tap like we heard about. Um, a sense of needing to be active, on the go, never sitting still, like you're um, driven by a motor. There are symptoms of inattention. You're easily distracted. Uh, disorganized, forgetful, be <clears throat> impulsive, blurt things out, say things, do things without thinking. Uh, there are associated symptoms that for some of my patients are even more important than the inattentiveness. Um, emotionally overreactive, very sensitive to criticism, um, very uh, labile mood, meaning from moment to moment, you could be happy when somebody says something nice to you, a few minutes later you're criticized, and now you're depressed for the rest of the day. Um, a lot of people with ADHD are just chronically unhappy. Not full-blown depression, although depression is more common in people with ADHD than in others. Just this sense of dissatisfaction, um, not being content, and consequently, a lot of people with ADHD are not pleasant to be around, and they'll admit it. How physicians look at ADHD has uh, changed dramatically in the last 20 years or so. When I was in training, this was a childhood condition. I had a three-month child neurology rotation. We saw a few children with ADHD, and that's pretty much my experience. 23, 24 years ago, I came to Rhode Island to join another behavioral neurologist at Butler Hospital. And I saw a handful of people who were sent to me because of temper outbursts. And there are some neurological conditions that can predispose to temper outbursts, but these patients didn't have any of those problems. So I started doing reading about what were called rage attacks or episodic discontrol. Now this is in the late 80s, so I was looking at old literature from the 70s. And a lot of articles about rage attacks would give lists of contributing causes. And at the bottom of the list would be something like childhood hyperactivity, minimal brain dysfunction. A couple of these patients back 1987, 1988, mentioned that they had been treated for hyperactivity when they were children. Um, Rhode Island, by the way, has had some very prominent ADHD specialists over the year. I still see patients who treated with Dr. Eric Denhoff 
uh, very prominent. And when I asked about their ADHD, of course, this was still, we were calling it hyperactivity or just plain old ADD. Uh, these patients said they don't think they ever outgrew it, but their doctors said, well, you're 16, you're 18, you can't have this anymore, you can't stay on your medicine. Back in the late 80s, I knew of only two psychiatrists in Rhode Island who were treating much ADHD. Uh, it was just sort of an orphan diagnosis. Nobody knew what to do. I crossed my fingers, wrote my first couple of Ritalin or Dexedrine prescriptions, and the patients did very well. They brought in relatives, they told their therapists, they sent more patients. When I left that practice based at Butler, went out on my own, I kept getting more and more referrals for ADHD in adults. Um, I have virtually stopped doing general neurology. Uh, my nurse practitioner and I treat between six and 700 adults with ADHD. Our population ranges from 15 to 83. Uh, the ADHD does not go away. Some of the hyperactive symptoms tend to burn out, usually by your 30s, but not necessarily. Uh, the attentional symptoms tend to persist. Patients come in to me, a variety of different presentations, different complaints, but they talk about not being able to focus at school or at work, no matter how hard they try. Uh, or something has changed in their life. Um, I had a woman a few years ago who was a um, white collar worker in a factory. She had her own little office cubicle, which I guess they're called officles. <laughs> and she was a great worker, great reviews, doing well, until the factory was sold and the new owners wanted to foster teen spirit. How did they do that? Open floor plan, no more cubicles. She could not function. Everything she saw out of the corner of her eyes, every little noise, she couldn't get her work done. So she came in, Doc, I think I just developed ADD. Well, you don't develop it as an adult. And it turned out she had all sorts of uh, childhood symptoms. Children who are intelligent and well-behaved almost never get diagnosed. The kids who get diagnosed are the ones who are disruptive or who are flunking. Uh, one of the myths that I still hear, even from other physicians, well, you graduated college or you went to medical school, you can't possibly have ADHD. It's just not true. Um, but this woman had a lot of little comments. Oh yeah, I was a nice kid. The teachers liked me, but there were always little comments like delightful little chatterbox, needs to learn <laughs> self-control, could be doing better. And then a question that I always ask patients now, did teachers ever change your seat and make you sit in the front next to the desk so they could keep an eye on you? I cannot tell you how common people go, oh yeah. <laughs> but yet they were never evaluated, they were never tested. Um, and that was this woman's uh, problem. A lot of children do get diagnosed when they hit high school. The teachers stop babying you, the workload goes up, and suddenly they can't keep up. But it is not unusual for people to go beyond high school. Uh, every year we get phone calls from Brown students. I'm assuming their parents didn't buy their way in. These were kids who were smart. They come to Brown and suddenly they're no structure. They can't keep up with the work. <coughs> I treat seven or eight physicians. I have um, three or four Brown professors. People from all professions, walks of life, firefighters, um, accountants, business people, police officers, um, and some very successful uh, people. The symptoms of ADHD, for the most part, are not life-threatening. The exception is driving. 
Unmedicated ADD drivers have two to six times higher risk of speeding tickets and other moving violations, license suspensions, injuries. So if you are a very impulsive, disorganized driver, it could be a life-threatening disease. On Monday, one of my new patients uh, was a 24-year-old woman who has already totaled four cars. And not that she's speeding, but her cell phone rings, she starts looking for it, boom. Or just driving along and not realizing she just went through a stop sign because she was daydreaming. Um, so the decision about what to do for the ADHD is very, very personalized. Uh, this is not uncontrolled high blood pressure or diabetes or something that you have to do something for. The decision about treatment is based on whether you think your symptoms justify accepting whatever risks there are with medication. <clears throat> There are very few areas in neurology, psychiatry, as controversial as the whole issue of medicine and ADHD. And there's probably more nonsense um, spouted by different people than almost anything else uh, in medicine. Stimulant medications have been used for this condition for a very, very long time. Now, the two doctors I see can't answer the question. Anybody want to take a guess about the first article published about using stimulants for a group of children with what we would now call ADHD was published? The 80s. 80s. 1902. <laughs> <laughs> You're closer. 1937. Uh, and the reason I know that is because it was done locally. Dr. Charles Bradley of the Bradley Hospital, Bradleys. If you've ever been to the hospital, they have oil paintings of all these Dr. Bradleys with the long beards, coats. Um, he actually gave stimulants to children to see if it would prevent them from getting headaches from a test known as a pneumoencephalogram. Back in the 30s, there were no CAT scans or MRIs. These kids had behavior problems, you would do an x-ray after injecting air through a spinal tap. <laughs> Headache. The, uh, they gave the, uh, a cousin of Adderall, really, an, am an amphetamine to see if it would prevent the headache. It didn't, but I guess the nurse or the staff people went up to him and said, well, they still have headaches, but they're nice and quiet. <laughs> um, stimulant medications are among the most studied class of drugs out there. Ritalin, everybody's heard of Ritalin. Tom Cruise jumps up and down and says it's a poison. Matt Lauer, don't give it to um, Ritalin's been around since 1955. So when you hear somebody say, we don't understand much about ADHD, we don't know a lot about these drugs, it's just not true. There is an enormous amount of research about medications. It doesn't mean they're risk-free. It doesn't mean there are no side effects. It doesn't mean there are no complications. It does not mean that they work for everybody. Um, but if you diagnose someone accurately and you monitor their medications appropriately, the stimulants are among the most um, effective group of medications that are used for any condition in psychiatry. Um, I think at least 80-85% of people will respond well to stimulant medications. Uh, success rate for antidepressants, 40%, 45%? Roughly? If that. If that. If that. Okay. But yet, you know, there's this great fear. In part, I mean, I hear a lot of stories about children, especially less likely in adults, who are like zombies when they went on Ritalin almost always means they were given too much medicine. It was too strong a dose. Um, and again, not perfect, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about these medications and what they can do. The benefits can be dramatic. Um, I've had students come in flunking out, going to honor roll. Uh, people coming in who are on the verge of losing jobs who are now being promoted. Um, it does not mean that every single symptom is eliminated. 
It's not like you, know, you go to an eye doctor and if you're lucky, he says or she says, I can get you to 2020. Um, there are a lot of symptom checklists that you can get online or in books and you rate your symptoms. What I tell my patients is that the medication should knock your symptoms one or two columns down, but we're not going to get you into the zero column for everything. Um, the ADHD can have enormous impact on many aspects of life. People with ADHD are more likely to be divorced and have multiple remarriages. Um, a, a higher rate of loss of jobs and vocational underachievement. Uh, less likely to graduate from college or go on to graduate school. Uh, people with ADHD have higher health expenses. And I don't know exactly the reason. I've always thought it's because they ignore things, they're inattentive. So by the time they go for treatment, they're sicker than other people. And then they don't pay attention when they're getting instructions, so they have more complications because they didn't uh, follow treatment recommendations. Um, I, I mean, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. This is a real disease. It's not caused by watching too much television or playing too many video games. It's very interesting. People with ADHD love doing those things. They're not as good at it as other people. So they spend a lot of time on them because they need that stimulation, but they're not as good. You give them medicine, and parents always ask me about, well, if my son or daughter takes medication, will it make him want to do his homework? No. <laughs> it, will let, it will let your son or daughter be more effective if he or she chooses to do homework, but if she chooses to goof off, you'll goof off better. <laughs> um, ADHD is not an American disease. You'll sometimes hear that, well, it was the people who had the courage and the impulsivity to emigrate, and they all wound up in this country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there have been population studies in many countries in Europe, Latin America, uh, Australia, New Zealand. The rate of ADHD is very similar to the rate of ADHD here. Um, four summers ago, I was fortunate enough to be invited to give a series of lectures on ADHD in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And there were over 400 people attending the lecture. Um, so again, even in Latin America, in a fairly poor community, uh, this exists. It's not just this country. Um, I, I could go on for a long time, but uh, I think I'll stop and I'll take questions because there are usually lots of questions. Yes? When you're looking for the treatment, I never hear you mention any dietary changes or lifestyle changes. And I'm always curious about why dietary changes, dietary habits aren't explored to see if there might be some changes that might uh, They are, and now we're, apparently now we're looking into the Feingold diet again, which was never replicated. Feingold diet in the 70s, food additives, sugar. Um, I've had a lot of people very interested in that, and they will follow very strict regimens. I've rarely seen major differences. Children may be different. But in the adult population, I haven't seen major differences. Um, there is one psychiatrist who has a book called Healing ADD, Dan Amen, and he has sort of says there are six types of ADD, and he recommends particular nutritional approaches. Um, we we talk to our patients about eating a balanced diet, uh, things of that nature. We talk about a lot of nutritional things. I mean, there are, um, there are things that are done. But there's not been a huge body of research showing that those um, approaches are anywhere nearly as effective for the vast majority of patients as the medications are. Well, of course you wouldn't know that. Because? Because of the pharmaceutical industry. No, but there are other sources of information. There are, no, there are other sources of information. Um, and I will, for people who are interested, there's a list of herbal products that we will recommend. And I've had people come back and find that there were benefits to those things. I've also had them complain that they were too expensive. Um, 
There's a complicated regimen of blue-green algae, and it costs two, three hundred dollars a month. Um, it's a lot, you know, the other thing is people want a quicker fix, and the medications do work quickly, and they do work well. Um, there are other treatments as well. I mean, there are cognitive behavior therapy, there are um, other behavioral modification approaches, there's EEG biofeedback. Uh, so there are other things. I mean, uh, it's not just the medication. Counseling for most people, family therapy. If it's known that it's a, a inefficient amount of dopamine, has there, have, are they doing any studies of what could be used to uh, yeah. cause more dopamine to be in the, in the front part of the brain? Or? Well, and that, that presumably is the site of location where the stimulants work. Stimulants mm -hmm. elevate the level of the neurotransmitters. It's interesting, however, that the standard Parkinson's disease medications that work on dopamine other than a few little studies that's found benefits, the standard Parkinson medicines don't work for ADD. So it, it's not just, hey, you don't have enough dopamine, so why don't you take amino acids that lead to dopamine production, and the problem will be solved. It doesn't work. I got two, two questions. One is, what is the rate in the general population? And the other is, could you talk a little bit about, about people self-medicating? <laughs> okay. Uh, depending on the studies, the surveys, probably in the area of 4 to 10 percent. Uh, more common in males than females, but not nearly as much as what we used to read years ago where they would talk about it being 10 to 1. Um, girls with AD, ADHD are less likely to be hyperactive than boys. And since the hyperactivity is so obvious, that's what gets the attention and the diagnosis. Um, my practice, it's probably 50-50 men and women, but there's, that's complicated because men are less likely to seek treatment for anything that sounds like mental health. <laughs> so there's a male predominance. Self-medication, um, the rate of substance abuse in unmedicated adults with ADHD is roughly double yeah. the population at large. And <coughs> marijuana, can't tell you how often I hear it's the only thing that quiets the brain down. Unfortunately, it interferes with stimulus processing and attention mechanisms, so <laughs> double-edged sword. Um, a lot of people have tried cocaine, and they'll say things like, wow, when I tried cocaine, my friends were all jumping around, and I sat down and read a book. It made me nice and quiet. <laughs> um, Alcohol, there's certainly a, a higher rate of alcoholism. Cigarette smoking, extremely common in ADHD. And back before cigarettes were as untolerated as they are now, children who started smoking before age 16, a very high rate of them have ADHD. And they would learn that if they smoked a cigarette between classes, it would give them about 40 minutes to focus because nicotine elevates levels of dopamine in the brain. And they are looking into nicotine patches. <laughs> yes? Um, why, if it's a stimulant, does it calm them and make them Oh, I'm like glad you asked. Then, <laughs> um, here's my analogy. You're at the Providence Place Mall, and the guards are napping. And the teenagers start running around and causing all sorts of trouble. The guard wakes up, drinks some coffee, gets going, starts patrolling, the children and the teenagers quiet down. The teenagers are the ADHD symptoms. The guard is the frontal lobe. You, you're hyperactive because the motor control parts of the brain are not being controlled. The medication improves the level of control, so now the hyperactivity and the other symptoms are reduced. But even to the point of making kids zombie-like? It can be. Occasionally in adults, uh, although adults, if they get too much of a stimulant, they react the way you would expect. They get jittery. Uh, the other thing is, and this is, I, I've had uh, patients come from other um, doctors, the symptom, as you increase the dose of medicine, 
the symptoms reduce. But it's not indefinitely, and there comes a point where the curve goes back up. So if you give somebody too much medication, they will start getting more hyper again. And you can get into a vicious uh, cycle because patients will say, well, I'm still hyper, I'm still restless. Oh, you need more medicine. They get a higher dose, and they're still hyper. Um, so, and, and then get big problems by over-medicating people. So. Yes? Um, of the people who come in to see you asking to be tested for ADHD, about what percentage do you diagnose as actually having it? And then also, what about meditation? Uh, I'll answer that. This meditation question is easier to answer. It works wonderfully. Meditation and also exercise are very, very good for the hyperactivity. Um, some people, however, are so inattentive they can't learn the techniques to meditate. Um, but that works very well. Um, the other question is more complicated because my practice is so specialized that I think there's a certain amount of screening that's already gone on before people are sent to me. Um, I also started using a computerized uh, test that was developed a few years ago that has about 90% accuracy. So a very high percentage of the people who are coming into our office have ADHD. Um, you know, people go online, they, go, they read books, they do the screening tests. A lot of our patients have family members. And that would be the one other big thing. This is one of the most genetic conditions we see. Now, I'm not talking about eye color, hair, single gene things. The only other common complex trait that's more genetic than this is height. <laughs> ADHD is more genetic than migraine, hypertension, schizophrenia, asthma. Uh, so a lot of our adult patients come in after a child or in some cases a grandchild is diagnosed. So it's a very <coughs> high percentage. Um, every once in a while we'll have people come in who have undiagnosed anxiety. The other thing that can mimic ADHD, this is, sounds surprising, is sleep apnea. Um, people with undiagnosed sleep apnea or other sleep disorders will have daytime cognitive symptoms that can mimic ADD. Um, so. mm -hmm. What about behavioral things? I'm thinking in terms of the classroom, you know, for teachers, you know, rather than letting kids be agitated, trying to teach them to still themselves, is that helpful? I almost want to shunt it to more of a specialist in the audience. Um, I, I don't deal with younger children, so I don't know that I can address that directly. Um, sorry. Did you have? No? Okay. What about drugs that do not stimulate? Non-stimulants. Yes, non-stimulants. There is one, I think. Um, actually, now there are three approved non-stimulants, and there are a whole bunch of unofficial off-label medicines. They work, but not for as high a percentage of patients. And the results are, on average, not as strong. Uh, the first approved non-stimulant for ADHD is called Stratera. Um, I probably have a success rate of maybe half my patients that you have better results with Stratera now. Um, you know, it's interesting. You say, oh, it's a non-stimulant. It's going to be easier to use, safer. Uh, horrible problems with upset stomach, getting people acclimated to it. Um, and when it works, it rarely does as much for the average person as the stimulants do. There are two old blood pressure drugs that have recently been released in new long-acting forms. Maybe effective for pediatrics, but the adult population, I, I've not had huge success with those medicines. For a lot of people, though, there are off-label medicines, meaning once a drug is marketed and released and it's legal, we can prescribe it for anything. Um, the only thing when you say off-label, that just means that the FDA doesn't allow the manufacturer to market the drug. 
Uh, for many, many years, blood pressure medicines known as beta blockers mm -hmm. were used to prevent migraines. It was years before any of those uh, manufacturers did the research so that they could say for migraine prevention, but neurologists were using it, those medicines for decades. Um, particular antidepressants, Wellbutrin, uh, can be very effective for ADHD. If someone came to me with significant depression, if they were also overweight and smoking and had ADD, I would put them on Wellbutrin. It's also known as Zyban to stop smoking, and it's one of the few antidepressants that can cause weight loss. Uh, it works for about half the people who try it. Um, before Prozac came along, the main family of antidepressants were the tricyclics, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, drugs like that. For children who had tics, next month's show, hmm. and ADHD, and there is a higher rate of uh, those conditions occurring together, you would not usually give stimulants to children with tics, so they would give them the tricyclic antidepressants, and those work for some people. I think most of us who do ADHD would be thrilled if the non-stimulants worked better, or easier for well. us. Or at least as well. Yeah. Well, at least as well. Well, better than they work, you know, because <laughs> stimulant medicines, we have to write a prescription every month. There are no refills. We can't call the pharmacy. We can't fax the prescription. Those non-stimulants, you can write a refill and write five, five refills, and the patient has six months worth of medicine. So it would be a lot easier if they worked better, but they just don't. Um, how about this side of the room? Very quiet. <laughs> well, okay. Yes. Are there interactions with other types of uh, medications that people can't take if they're um, taking them? There are some interactions, but not a huge number, by the way. Um, the commonest problem is in people who are taking decongestants the you know, Sudafed or phenylpropanolamine, those are sort of mild stimulants. So if you're going to be on a decongestant, you may have to lower your dose of stimulant. Um, of uncommonly prescribed MAO inhibitors, you would not put people on stimulants with those, but they're not widely used uh, these days. Um, in just a general sense, you don't give stimulants to people with certain structural disease of the heart, heart rhythm problems, uncontrolled high blood pressure, a history of major psychiatric illness. Uh, but medications, surprisingly few interactions. Um, every once in a while, we'll actually have a person who goes on a stimulant with high blood pressure, and their pressure gets lower when they're on the stimulant. Because they're less frantic, they're less hyper, they're less overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the internist can't believe it, but the stimulant helps relax them. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I'm just a little unclear. Um, it seems like there's so many reasons and different um, things that can cause someone to be unfocused or impatient or, uh, you know, these things that seem to define, the, uh, the mm -hmm. or characterize ADHD. Are, do you care about that or are you just sort of saying wherever it comes from it's called ADHD or is it something specific? Well, it's, if you look at a list of ADD symptoms, I doubt there's anybody in this room who wouldn't look at the long list and say, well, I have some of that once in a while. What makes the diagnosis is that the person with ADHD has many or most of the symptoms in many different situations. And the important part of the diagnosis is that the symptoms are interfering significantly in life. So, sure, a lot of people get impatient waiting on the line at the supermarket or at the bank, but the person with ADHD who just throws the groceries down and walks out, that's a little different. It's a question of degree, pervasiveness of the symptoms, um, and it's part of, it's, it's a tough question clinically because a lot of people say, well, I'm a little forgetful, you know, how do I know they really have this and they're not just trying to do too much, not getting enough sleep? You're right, there are a lot of reasons you could be inattentive. You know, you're looking at the history, you really, really have to get symptoms dating back to childhood. Now, this is not something that just 
cropped up. Um, it's not something that's only present in one small aspect of life. But, you know, that's, that's why we have a tough job, right, Ethan? <laughs> yes? Um, I have two questions. One, um, does caffeine do anything helpful? Two, um, are there any long-range studies that you know of since Ritalin's been around for such a long time about long-term toxicity? Because I'm assuming people have to be on it for a very long time. Okay, um, so first question about caffeine. I have actually diagnosed a few people who developed, supposedly, their symptoms after they started having reflux or gastritis and had to stop drinking coffee. And they came in saying, I think I just developed ADD. Um, I'm thinking of two men. Both started drinking large amounts of coffee in high school because they learned that it helped them function. Caffeine is a mild stimulant. One of my questions is, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? When a person looks at me and says, Doc, you mean how many pots a day? <laughs> I know those people will do very well with stimulant medicine. <laughs> the problem is caffeine is absorbed very quickly. And if you were to sip a little bit slowly through the day, it might be worthwhile. But when you drink a lot, suddenly you get this surge. You're going to get some of the side effects. Then it drops off. And again, for some people, it can cause uh, stomach problems. But yeah, caffeine can do some of what a stimulant does. Um, you know, there have been observational studies, long-term effects. Surprisingly little data showing serious problems with the stimulants. You know, stimulants are also used to treat things like narcolepsy. And narcolepsy tends to develop in young adults and not go away. So people with narcolepsy have to stay on it a lifetime. Um, clearly, you have to monitor people to make sure that their blood pressure is under control. But I'm just not aware of really good evidence about these stimulants having a, a cumulative side effect. Ethan, you have any? No, it's just. Yeah. In children, <clears throat> there was a question as to whether it would suppress growth yeah. because stimulants tend to diminish appetite. So right. the thought was if you give it to a young child who's um, not eating as well, will he not achieve normal adult stature? And the outcome studies um, have shown that if there is any suppression of of growth compared with kids who've never been on stimulants, it's it's not very much. But that's but that's looking at um, you know all children who are on stimulants versus children who've never been on stimulants. So for an individual child, it's conceivable there might be some child whose um, whose growth will not be as much as it would be otherwise. But by and large, it has <coughs> little if any effect on growth. Now, a related question that often comes up is, if you give children stimulants, does that lead to drug abuse in the future? And in fact, there have been studies tracking this, and the opposite is true. When you treat early, you have a lower rate of substance abuse um, in your teens and uh, early adult years. Yes? I'm curious, because it's gotten so much attention over the past, say, 20 years. Um, do you think it's overdiagnosed? I mean, there are certainly legitimate, but uh, a condition, but yeah. um, it, it's really sort of a community thing. In some communities, it is overdiagnosed. There's no question about it. Although it's very interesting that there was a study a few years ago that looked at all of the children who had been diagnosed, and something like less than half of them were actually on medicine. Uh, but yeah, certainly there are going to be communities <coughs> where. It just, the numbers don't seem um, accurate. Overall, though, if you look at adults, only a small percentage of adults with ADHD have been diagnosed. Um, so I think, again, a lot depends on the community. But you know, clear, it's very tough because, you know, again, I use the, you know, this quotient computerized test to, to increase accuracy. But you're talking about a condition 
that's largely based on getting a history. Somebody has to come in and describe a list of symptoms. Well, if you're really motivated to get the diagnosis, you know, you, you can learn the list of symptoms. Now, if you come to me and say, Doc, ever since I was a kid, I can't sit still, I have trouble reading because I lose my place over and over again, I'm forgetful, I'm disorganized, I blurt things out. You know, there's no, how, how, how do we know? Um, there's, I stopped telling people we're going to have a gene test soon because after 10, 15 years, it's never come. Uh, we don't have a single blood test. Um, so there's one clinician who does these fancy spec scans, a nuclear medicine study, and he says he can see patterns in the brain, but that's not widely available or widely accepted. Um, so it's, it's a tough diagnosis. You really have to ask a lot of questions. You look at the family history, and you have to have a, a gut feeling for what you're hearing. It's not always easy. Just to point out another thing that can be confusing is any <coughs> average person who takes a stimulant will be able to increase their performance a little bit. You know, it gives you a 2% edge, but the difference between a person who's functioning, say, at 50% of their capacity who takes a stimulant that brings them up to 98% versus someone who's functioning at 96% and goes up to 98%. So you can find small differences of improvement uh, but that, um, you know, it's not needed for the people functioning in the normal and, way. And that's actually a big thing. Um, <laughs> second, there's something now called cosmetic neurology. Mm -hmm. I don't mean Botox. Um, people who don't have a disease <coughs> asking for the medicine. I'm a little forgetful. Should I take Aricept or one of those other Alzheimer medicines? Um, a lot of academics will try and get on stimulants so they can stay up later, do more writing, do more <coughs> research. Uh, in fact, it's gotten so widespread that the American Academy of Neurology actually went and issued a position paper about what should a neurologist do if you are asked to prescribe a stimulant for somebody who doesn't have ADD. And I was a little surprised. The Academy said you're allowed to do it, but you don't have to. And you have to take special precautions to let people know that there's very little research about the effect of stimulants in people without ADHD. You know, a lot, the research, you do studies on patients and see how the medicines work, but people who don't have the condition, very little research. Um, and there are physicians who will do it. And we get phone calls once in a while. Hey, you know, uh, before finals, I could really use uh, some help. I tried my friend's Adderall once, give me a prescription. And we actually don't even do that for people with ADD. Either you're kind of interested in being treated, not, you know, just for finals or, you know, once in a blue moon. Yes? So I had a couple of questions. One is about that. Like, I know of tons of people going to college who would just would be on ADD and I would sell it. Yeah. And I I witnessed a lot of abuse of ADD and had personal friends who of, of the Adderall. Of Adderall, yeah. sorry, sorry, not ADD. <laughs> and like friends who at a young age were diagnosed and given ADD, but then given Adderall. I had a up. I have ADD. Yo, we got ADD for sales. So and then I was interested by what you said about people not being addicted addicted because I know of people who like started abusing the Adderall, oh, yeah. and it became a huge problem, along with other things. So, um, and, and one of the things I felt like was that some of my friends weren't going to therapy as well, yeah. which I saw as a huge problem. Yeah. So I'm wondering, and, and I saw them just go to the doctor, bang, prescription, get the Adderall, that's it. And I saw that as a huge problem. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, Adderall is probably the most abused drug on college campuses right now. Uh, five, ten dollars a pill. Um, but again, it's because even if you don't have ADD, there's probably a benefit if you use some stimulant medication. Um, most, most people with ADHD, if they take too much of their stimulant, they feel lousy. Um, I, years ago, some of the big ADD specialists would say they've never seen a patient abuse the stimulant. It's not true. 
Uh, I've had patients who I know have ADD snort it, overdose, abuse it, party. Um, but most people who have ADHD don't enjoy taking the medicine. They just feel lousy. People without ADD, yeah, if you're on small amounts, a little bit at a time, you'll be okay. But if you stay on it steady, you start needing more and more. You stop taking it, you crash. It's highly addictive, and that's why it's so controllable. Another question? No? Oh, yes. Um, there's a lot of things about um, people with ADD that they, they many things like they crash a lot, they, they do bad in school. And I, I, I'm sorry, I just kept hearing bad things. Is there any good things about it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Sometimes, no, no, listen, I just, I if just you look at some people, um, the founder and former CEO of JetBlue has ADD. Oh, where's Island dude? Do? Uh, okay. Um, I think they say that um, Edison, the great inventor, had ADHD. Uh, some people with ADHD are extraordinarily creative, imaginative. Uh, of course, there's a fine line between being spontaneous and creative versus impulsive, <coughs> not crossing over. Um, there are some people who are extraordinarily talented artistically who have ADHD and they're able to channel that sort of impulsivity uh, into uh, creative ways. Uh, but you know, it's very individualized. Um, and in terms of academic success, I have some extraordinarily accomplished academic uh, patients, people who are professors, book writers, Poet actually. And these are people on drugs or on no drugs? Uh, <laughs> no, on medication. And it's also interesting because so a lot of people think that if you're creative, you're not going to be able to do your art when you're on medicine. Mm -hmm. um, most of the artists I've treated found that they do better on medicine. One woman preferred to do her artwork without medicine, but everything else in her life, you know, pay the bills, do the groceries, that's what she medicated. <laughs> so it's very, very individualized. Maybe that's a beautiful way to uh, end with the positive. <laughs> See that you do it now. <laughs> 